take a crack and it's not loading up, so I'm gonna, I'm having computer problems now. Typical uh, for a so. And for those of you, uh, sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties on this side. So um, for everybody out there watching, just know that we're, we're solving a few technical difficulties uh, with our first speaker. Um, you might see him talking about those technical difficulties right now. And so um, if we can have every one of our speakers, please hit mute. Um, that would be really helpful. Uh, and we'll go ahead and get everybody uh, situated and started. So what we're gonna do uh, while our first speaker is working out some of his technical difficulties is I'm gonna reintroduce myself <laughs> uh, for anybody who missed it. Um, I am Amy Oliver. I'm the Visitor and Science Center Manager at the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory in Amato, Arizona. If you didn't hear me tell you to Google it, go ahead and do that. Um, and also, uh, I am the Public Affairs Officer for the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory of which uh, Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory is a part. Today, we also have one of our volunteers with us, Stephen Brown, he's gonna be helping to answer your questions in the chat box um, and to interact and help things go a little bit smoother today. And we also have our friends from the Tucson Amateur Astronomical Association. Bernie will correct me if I said that wrong. Uh, Bernie Stinger is here uh, representing TAAA today. We have Derek Demeter uh, from the Emil Beeler Planetarium. He will correct me on that pronunciation as well since I've got it wrong three times in the past. And uh, we have uh, Justin Cirillo, who is here representing. Um, Justin, you're going to say the name of your astronomical society, Central Florida Astronomical Society. You got it. Uh, and we are waiting for one more presenter to come in and join us today. So uh, everybody uh, sit back and relax, enjoy the show. And remember today, we're not looking at the night sky, but we are actually observing the sun. So uh, today is the summer solstice, if you were unaware, for the northern hemisphere, remember that. Uh, down in the southern hemisphere is actually the winter solstice. So uh, they're having a little bit of a different day today down there as they are having their shortest day of the year while we are having our longest day of the year. This is the official first day of summer as well uh, for the northern hemisphere. So if it's a really hot outside where you are, like it is where we are, um, out in the Sonoran Desert, it's going to reach about 100 degrees today. Uh, and we're just praying for monsoon season and those monsoon rains to get with us. <laughs> so uh, everybody, uh, I'm going to introduce you now to uh, I'll pass it off to Derek Demeter. He's going to take over and uh, we'll see if we got some of those tech tech issues fixed. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, unfortunately, my microphone that I was, can everyone hear me for, for one? Give me a go, go, go ahead, because oh, unfortunately, because I had the microphone hooked up to the laptop, it was competing with the power use uh, of the camera, so I was getting major issues with the camera. But hello, everybody. Uh, so, Justin, if you can help me out with making um, this uh, use here as well, that would be wonderful. So, what we have here is we have a little type of telescope that we are using today called a hydrogen alpha telescope. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. And you all should be able to see this large gaseous kind of plume coming up here. I need to uh, quickly bring this a little bit, a little over those. So let me do that real quick. Um, this large plume of gas coming off the sun on the edge is called a prominence. And a prominence is seen in what we call the chromosphere. There's different layers of the sun. We have the photosphere, which is the surface of the sun. And just above that, we have this layer of gas called the chromosphere. It actually means color, um, color sphere. And uh, when you look at this in color, it actually has this red hue to it. You can actually see it during a total solar eclipse. It's all really neat. And these prominences are caused by these large magnetic fields that get lifted up above the surface of the sun. And these magnetic fields actually pull this gas, pull this gas from the surface of the sun up into this chromosphere and create these massive call loop problems. So you can see, uh, unfortunately right now, we're getting a little bit of cover here, but maybe we'll see some uh, some extra detail in a few minutes here. But these loop problems, these prominences get pushed up along what we call the magnetic field lines of the sun. So you get these nice loops and you can see when, the, the, when it's starting to come up, I can bring up the, uh, 
the exposure a little bit so we can see that. You can see how these promises kind of make these loops, and that's because the magnetic fields are pulling the material around uh, those magnetic fields. It's uh, pretty cool. Now, Justin, how big can these prominences get? Well, yeah, so if we take into account that uh, you can fit uh, about a million Earths inside of the sun. So let's put that scale right off the bat in perspective there. Uh, when you are looking at the sun, uh, it's, it's easy to kind of take, uh, uh, you know, into account the uh, size differences, but it might not be obvious. What you're looking at there in that uh, prominence that, that Derek showed you uh, was larger than the Earth. Um, some of these can reach uh, 40,000 kilometers in height. So um, when you're looking at things like sunspots, when you're looking at things like solar prominences, the scale of these is absolutely tremendous uh, that are shooting off into space. And Derek, talk a little bit about this shot. So this was uh, taken a few days ago during an event that Justin and I held for uh, colleges. And you can see massive, massive prominence that's coming off. You can see the curling and the twisting of the magnetic fields. And sometimes magnetic fields break apart. And what will happen is some of this gaseous material will basically hover above the sun's surface. And so then you get these plasma, the hot plasma um, that are just just above the surface. They call that, again, the thermosphere of the sun. But you also get these fountain provinces as well. Because what happens is, is that as the magnetic fields build up, what happens is the, this gas gets lifted up, and then all of a sudden, as the magnetic fields connect, you will see this gas eventually uh, kind of loop around and again create this loop from that we see. And I should be able to have should be able to have the sun now, so I'm going to go ahead and bring it back to the to the uh, GW. Looks like I lost it again. Uh, we're, that's the beauty of being in Florida is it's the sun going safe, but we do got a cloud cover, but it will pack again. Um, but also what we see with this Fusion Alpha telescope is we can see filaments. And filaments are shadows passed from, um, from prominences. And uh, you can see them along the surface of the, the disk of itself. So once we get the sun back, we should be able to uh, reduce the um, exposure and be able to take a look at the surface of the sun as well as... Uh, um, and what else can we see the sun surface as well? Let me go ahead and see if I can bring up a video real quick of, uh, of the surface sun. And while Derek's bringing up that video, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we do here uh, in Florida. We've got a beautiful planetarium on the campus of Seminole State College. And uh, we also have a, a fantastic uh, Astronomical Society, the Central Florida Astronomical Society. We've got about 100 members and just a great group of individuals who uh, range from everything from beginning uh, astronomers to very professional uh, astrophotographers. Uh, so uh, it's just a, a fantastic facility. And one of the things that we love to do is uh, when we have guests at the planetarium, especially the kids, is have the opportunity to show them the sun. And, and it's ironic that, um, you know, we, we, we know the sun's there all the time. We feel the heat, we see the light, but um, it's very infrequent that we actually take the time to look at it, unless there's something amazing happening like a total solar eclipse. And these uh, crafty little glasses here are a savior for the kids uh, to be able to look at our star uh, all the time. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, so I have another video here. This one is taken when we lower the exposure down of, uh, of the camera. And what you can see here is you can see kind of these darker bands on the sun. And those are shadows that are casted off of the, of the sun surface. You can even see little tiny sunspot groups, which hopefully one of our other uh, participants will be able to see more about what sunspots are. And we're looking at the chromosphere. We're looking at that layer just above the, uh, the sun surface. Uh, and hopefully I'm going to stop sharing my screen again and share the ZWO camera. And, uh, and hopefully we'll get a view of the sun here. Um, and what I need to do is I need to move the camera real quick. That oh, again. Uh, the battle of the sun. That's what we do in Florida is we battle the sun during this time of year. 
um, it's a <laughs> pretty wild. But as Justin was saying earlier, one of the things you can do uh, to look at the sun yourself is you get yourself a pair of solar glasses, and these solar glasses uh, will allow you to look at the photos of the sun, which is really, really cool. And how cool is it normally to tell your friends and your family that you can safely look at the sun with, uh, with just your eyes? So I think that's pretty neat there. So, uh, yeah, so um, I know uh, right now we're waiting for the sun to uh, pop back up again. Um, uh, do we have any Amy so far from the people watching? We don't have any questions, but if you want, Derek, what I'll do is uh, since you brought up sunspots, um, I can go ahead and share. Um, I can share a video of a sunspot if you'd like to, I, I don't want to interrupt your talking, but I can bring up this video and um, that we have from one of our space-based telescopes at the Center for Astrophysics. And I can let you, uh, oh, I guess I turned off my video. Look at that. Um, and you can go ahead um, and do that if, you, if you'd like. Yeah, I'm happy to, uh, to share that and let you go ahead and talk about that. So yeah. let me. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we, uh, we have the sun, but it just decides to be shy right when we're about to get information about it. But these uh, sunspots, remember we talked about the magnetic field on the sun, and um, these magnetic fields twist material above the surface, creating influences. What happens is these magnetic fields that are created by the sun's surface are, are, are actually underneath it, too, are actually uh, then can also distort and puncture the surface of the sun, revealing what we call these convection layers, these layers underneath the sun of this churning hot gas and this cold, cold fluid material. And what you get is you get these hard, dark spots in the sun that could be as big as, um, as the Earth, big as Jupiter. They're massive. So you get these two, so these fields are producing these unique features. Uh, the punctures, which you saw earlier with a telescope, and uh, these sunspots, which you see here. Now, the sun, of course, goes to different um, cycles, at solar minimum and solar maximum. So right now, the magnetic fields of the sun are, are kind of weak right now, so we're not seeing a whole lot of sunspot activity. But we do still see some magnetic fields um, that are buried on the sun, and they do produce these prominences. So now, sometimes these prominences can snap, like a rubber band, these magnetic fields can snap. And what happens is, is that you can get these large explosions on the sun called flares. And um, they're really, really neat to see as well. And of course, uh, hopefully we'll be able to take a look at some of that information. I know Amy has some views of uh, some of the, um, the space telescopes that are look currently looking at the sun as well. I have a, quite and, a few things. But actually, so it looks like uh, Stephen's got a few questions coming through for you in the chat. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so Stephen, if you just want to start at the top, I'm going to unshare my screen. Maybe. <laughs> Get on muted. Okay. Um, first one is how large of a flare will cause us interference on Earth? So we have these uh, X flares, basically these massive things called frontal mass ejections that are huge. I mean, we're talking thousands on thousands, actually millions of times greater than Earth, uh, that if they are directed towards Earth, um, they can uh, disrupt our uh, magnetic field so much that they can cause interference um, in power outages, loss of satellites. Uh, so these are actually things that we don't really want to uh, um, have happen. So we actually have set space satellites that uh, watch for these what we call coronal holes. Basically, the sun has an atmosphere called the corona, and these holes can be pockets where these large coronal mass ejections can erupt from. And we want to look for them and look for any chances of these massive X flares to erupt. And so there are space weather people out there that look at the sun, look for these flares, and look for chances of these massive eruptions that could be uh, things that could be damaging here uh, on Earth. So, so this is a large flare that just erupted off, that, that, that has erupted from that, uh, from that, or from that coronal hole, and as they get out in the space, and ending, you know, these all this, these these particles, solar particles, traveling at a million miles an hour, um, and uh, some of these can be very, very nasty. Um, Justin, do you have anything cool to add to flares? 
Well, yeah, I mean, these are uh, situations where we, we want to learn more about them. Um, the, some of the largest ones are called uh, Carrington events. And uh, the Carrington event was actually a, a geomagnetic storm in 1859. It was, it was uh, a coronal mass injection that was so powerful uh, that it, uh, it knocked out telegraph systems all over Europe, uh, North America failed. Uh, in certain situations, uh, telegraph operators were given electric shocks, uh, telegraph pylons through sparks. So uh, these can happen, um, but the perfect conditions have to exist, right? Uh, when this leaves the sun, uh, the earth has to be in its path. And of course, we are just a one small rock orbiting this massive uh, ball of gas. So. Um, you know, it's important that we learn more about them. It's we're, we're working on sending more spacecraft towards the sun. I know we'll be talking about today. I know we'll be talking about uh, the solar orbiter, which are exciting uh, NASA and ESA projects going to the sun to, to teach us more about how can we protect ourselves or have advanced warning for these types of situations. All right, so I have the, the sun is starting to peak out again. If I could just quickly share one more time before we finish up yep. here, so we give people a view of the sun. Yep, you're ready. All right, let's go ahead and do that. All right, so here we have our sun. And right now I have decreased the exposure a little bit so you can kind of ride around the sun and look at the sun surface or the chromosphere. And you can see if the sun is this. We zoom out a little bit here. We're going to go to 100%. Uh, or 200% would be good. Um, there we go. Let me zoom in a little bit more and hold on to the controller. So you can see uh, as we zoom around, you can see that surface of the sun here. Um, and, uh, and you can see there's a filament right here on the uh, top um, on the top left. That's the prominent right there that's kind of creating a shadow band there um, and you can actually see one here along the edge there so pretty neat you can actually see some of these details uh, but i'm going to actually increase the exposure a little bit see if we can see any other promises like we got another one here on the on the right side of the sun or in this case the left side of the sun we can see that coming off right there we have another uh, prominence uh, on this, oh, a lot of prominences today. Let me increase the, uh, the on that too. You can see right here uh, again another large plume of gas. Eventually, they're going to produce these nice loops if uh, everything works correctly there. Um, so yeah, we got some really interesting uh, features on the sun currently right now. Let's see that down here. See if there's anything going on down here. A couple of small ones. That's pretty crazy. Uh, we'll go around again to see how that other promise is doing. Wow, that's looking really good still. Look at that. Wow. Now it's complete. You got that complete um, loop there. There we go. Look at that. Yep. Kind of almost looks like two eyes looking at you, doesn't it? I think so. There we go. Get that nice view of that, that so again, this I love those prominences where you can actually you really capture that looping uh, 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 feature where a lot of times you're just seeing uh, the gases, the plasma shooting straight out. But this one is fantastic where you get that actual looping feature. It's, uh, that's, a, that's amazing. Now, uh, these prominences can last hours. They can last days, weeks, and even months. So sometimes prominences can be there for, for a very long time. So see how, and what, and of course, uh, and we always talk about this when we, when we teach the children at our, at our, during our elementary program. You're actually not seeing the light right now, are we? Yeah, we're doing a little bit of time traveling here, right? It takes eight minutes and 20 seconds for that light to travel from the surface of the sun and reach us here on earth even though that light began probably about a hundred thousand years ago in the core of the sun once it hits the surface 8.2 minutes to get here but yeah what we're seeing now is uh eight minutes ago yeah so so think about that next time you when you're getting a sun you know sunbathing or having fun in the sun you're actually seeing the sun as it is right now 
But anyway, I'm glad we the sun finally came out and we got a chance to kind of take a view of the sun currently. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And I want to thank you all for uh, for having us out again and see the sun. And uh, uh, we look forward to seeing what we can learn today. All right. Thank you so much, Derek and Justin. And, and I want to tell you guys, you mentioned solar tornadoes uh, a little bit earlier in your presentation. And so we're going to actually cycle back around to you a little bit. I'm going to give you some of my time. Um, later because I was given a video by the Solar Dynamics Observatory of solar tornadoes. So I thought you might want to have that, that visual and be able to talk about it in that way. And I didn't want to interrupt what you were doing, but I found that video um, that they've taken rather recently, actually. So, um, so there's some really cool things going on that we can't always see from Earth. And I want to give a big shout out, by the way, uh, Pamela Shivak just logged on to our, our YouTube. And uh, Pamela is the founder and director of International Sunday, which is today, right? So it's on a Saturday, but it's International Sunday, which is a celebration of the sun. Um, and so that's also falling on summer solstice. So hi, Pamela, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, Pamela is also a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. She lives in Florida as well. So Derek, maybe you'll have an opportunity to meet Pamela sometime. Um, she's usually out on a beach somewhere. Uh, Showing the stars to people through her telescopes with her husband. So. Sorry, yeah, there's a lag. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, actually, her, we met before. She's actually helped some of our events at the Great. We are, we are in knowing each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pamela was great. She came out, uh, her and her husband came out to the, to the uh, Mercury Mercury transit of the sun. Uh, was that last summer? Gosh, time's flying. But uh, yeah, Pamela is fantastic. And uh, they have some uh, um, <laughs> incredible uh, solar system viewing tools. So, hey, Pam. All right. Um, so since you guys said that, so before we move on to, to Bernie here, um, I want to... Uh, let me see if that, that's my right one. Okay, so you guys brought up the Mercury transit and that was probably one of my favorite uh, events of all time. And so from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, we actually have um, some video from one of the space-based telescopes of the, the Mercury transit. And this video is not very long, so I'm gonna let it play out. But if you saw that, did everybody just see that? That little black dot that's just oh, flying yeah, that by. Oh yeah, that was great. I'm, I'm repeating. Um, but you can see that. Um, so that was a that was a pretty cool event, and to be able to see that also from the perspective of the SDO from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, and what that means that's outside of um, our atmosphere, and so we don't have clouds blocking us, and we don't have uh, atmospheric disturbances blocking us from being able to see what's going on. And we're actually going to talk about that a little bit later as well. So after we do solar tornadoes closer to the end, I'm going to show you guys what the sun looks like in different wavelengths and talk about why we, uh, why we do that. And um, so it's, it's going to keep going through some of the, the different footage that we were able to take of this event, but I'm going to go ahead and stop that for now. And we're going to switch over to Bernie, if I can get back into Zoom, sorry. Um, something's wrong. <laughs> All right. So uh, Bernie, you are up. Excellent. Uh, does everyone hear me okay? Great. Turn my microphone back on again. I'm uh, Bernie Stinger. I'm a member of the Tucson Amateur Astronomical so uh, Association and also the Minnesota Astronomical Society, where I spend my summers. And that's where I am presently, actually. I'm in a suburb of Minneapolis uh, called Richfield, not far from uh, the uh, Mall of America, if anybody has uh, traveled up into this area of the country. And Minnesota and here in Richfield, as is typical for this time of year, we have a cloudy overcast day with uh, no chance of viewing the sun, unfortunately. Uh, I was prepared for it, but unfortunately that's not going to work. However, I do have some photographs uh, that I'd like to share with you. Uh, let me see if I can pull that up. Okay, and uh, here's a, uh, an image I took uh, on the left on Wednesday when we had a nice sunny day. And today with the overcast and my 
telescope all bagged up because I didn't want it to get wet. There's a good chance of rain uh, in the next few hours. So on the left there, you can see my telescope. It's a, a Lunt uh, 60 millimeter hydrogen alpha scope. And I use a camera on it. So you can see the camera there in blue behind it. And that's feeding uh, a video signal back into my home where I can uh, enjoy the use of the telescope uh, in day or night uh, without having to deal with uh, the weather uh, or the bugs, for example. So um, I do have some pictures. Here's one that I took uh, on Wednesday of uh, the sun in hydrogen alpha. And you can see some nice prominences there. Uh, the sun is greatly overexposed. Uh, that's to make the prominences stand out. And at that time on Wednesday, uh, there was some fairly nice prominences uh, hanging around. Uh, I think they're probably, some of these at least, are probably still there today. Uh, and ones that you were looking at earlier with Derek's telescope. And uh, there was also some minor uh, objects on the surface, uh, very, very faint, and I'm sure nowhere near dark enough to, uh, to show as a, uh, a sunspot. Uh, as we all know, we're currently at a sunspot minimum right now. So I thought it'd be a good time to uh, maybe talk about the, uh, the solar cycle, the solar sunspot cycle. So currently, we are in solar cycle 25. Uh, that just started uh, in December of last year. And that will last until probably around 2030 with a peak around mid 2025. Uh, the last solar cycle, cycle 24, is still ongoing, uh, but will probably end uh, sometime this year. And if you look on the chart down below, you'll notice I've charted out uh, six of the last solar cycles with 22, 23, and 24 identified. Uh, you'll notice the number of sunspots decreased from 22 to 23 and took a much larger decrease uh, at 24. So there was a period of time back during cycle 24 when people were very concerned that there'd be no sunspots at all and that there may not be a cycle 25, but it is starting to show itself now. Uh, so there definitely will, will be one. So I have a question for those watching, uh, how long is a solar cycle? Is it five years? Is it 11 years? Is it 22 years? Is it 50 years? Uh, what, what's your guess on that? Let's keep that in mind and we'll explore that for a short period of time. One way to look at the solar cycle is to actually count the number of sunspots. And that's been going on ever since the mid 1700s. A gentleman by the name of uh, Samuel Schwab, he was a German astronomer uh, back in the sev uh, mid 1750s. Uh, noticed that the number of sunspots appeared to cycle up and down over a period of time. And ever since then, they've been watching and counting the number of visual sunspots. And that's shown in blue here, the, uh, the cycling of the sunspots. There's some sketchy information back in the 1600s, uh, but it wasn't worth uh, it wasn't reliable enough to, uh, to be utilized. Uh, telescopes were typically necessary to look at the number of sunspots. Uh, Galileo, for example, was an active sunspot watcher. Prior to 1600, uh, tree ring analysis and ice core samples uh, can be used to look back at the solar sunspot cycle. And they've been able to see them going back for over 11,000 years. So the sun has been oscillating with these sunspots for a very, very long period of time and probably will continue to do so. Looking again at the first graph, 
you'll notice the peak to peak period of sunspots, let's say from 70, uh, 1970 to the 1980s, appears to be a little over 11 years or 11, uh, 10 years. So 11 years looks like it's about right for the sunspot solar cycle. So that's one way to look at the solar cycle, but let's look at it in another way. Sunspots also have magnetic fields. Uh, as you saw earlier, um, these are magnetograms. They are another way of looking at the sun. Uh, the magnetograms show the magnetic polarity of sunspots. And shown here is sunspot AR2765, which just traversed the solar surface uh, over the last week. And it had a polarity of plus on the left and minus on the right. Sunspots that belong to the previous cycle, cycle 24, had minus on the left and positive on the right. And this flipping is caused from the changes of the sun's magnetic field. Sunspot polarity can also change from the southern or northern and southern uh, hemispheres of the sun. Here's another magnetogram showing the northern sunspot cycles of cycle 21 back in the 1980s having a different polarity than the sunspot cycle uh, on the southern hemisphere. You can see it's black on the left, white on the right and white on the left, black on the right, depending on the hemisphere. And in the next cycle, cycle 22, it switched. So they were white on the left, black on the right, or black on the left, white on the right, depending on northern or southern. So what this means is the magnetic cycle repeats every other visual sunspot cycle. It takes two visual cycles to start over again and repeat. So what answer is correct about the length of the solar cycle? Well, both B and C are correct. B, 11 years, is the visual sunspot cycle based on the visual count. But C is also correct. Because, because it is the length of the total magnetic cycle, something that most people don't know about when you talk about solar cycle. So now you know the rest of the story, that the solar cycle is 22 years. Any questions? We've got one, uh, Stephen, in there. Do you see that? We've got a question. You want to go ahead and read that out? Uh, which one was that? Uh, sorry, I muted myself. Vanessa has a question. I'll go ahead and read it out. Um, we are so spoiled by having amazing equipment to view and study the sun. I wonder how they did it in the 1700s. Who wants to take that? How did we view the sun in the 1700s? Well, they probably used, my guess would be uh, solar projection. That's a, an easy technique to use. And I wish I had a picture, I could show you that. But basically you aim your telescope at the sun. Back then they had re refractors. So you would uh, the long tube type of uh, telescope and you'd, you'd place a, uh, a disc uh, a piece of paper, a white, typically a white piece of paper uh, at the focal point behind the telescope, and it would project an image of the sun onto that white piece of paper. And then looking at the paper, you could visually try to count the number of sunspots that you could visually see. That would be my guess. Right. Yeah, uh, yes, that, that, that's pretty much what they did is they used solar projection um, for the most part um, to camera obscura 
Um, they, they would do is they would set up um, uh, you know, different, even like the Greenwich Observatory has a camera here that watches the, the position of the sun and they would allow for the projection of the sun on a big platform and they would be able to make observations that way. They weren't able to look at hydrogen alpha and all these fancy wavelengths. They would only be able to look at um, the view of the sun uh, through the through what we call white light. Uh, mm -hmm. So they would only be able to see uh, sunspots and, and things like that. Uh, funny story is that Galileo, uh, when he observed, because everybody knows Galileo is the famous scientist who discovered the moons of Jupiter and the, looked at the phases of Venus he, and craters of the moon, he also looked at the sun and he did it the wrong way he looked at the sun straight out without no uh protection so unfortunately over as he got older he uh, lost a lot of his eyesight and felt some really nasty cataracts uh so uh, when you're the first sometimes you make <laughs> the first mistake and that in that case galileo made actually the very first drawings of sunspots and, that, and, and different features on the sun but he had a, had a cost at the cost of his eyesight so uh, other astronomers start to, got, start to get smart on, um, on, on observing the sun. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Derek, for that explanation and for that information. So what we're going to do now is, um, previously I promised you guys, but because uh, Derek and Justin brought up solar tornadoes, that we were going to look at them. So we have some video from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. This is not... Um, real life uh, right now, right? It's it's a recording um, from previously because that isn't something that's always happening. So it's relatively recent video, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pull that up. Uh, so give me just a, a second here to do that. And then we're gonna turn it back over to those guys and let them talk to you about a solar tornado. And uh, Satish, I see your question, or Satish, I see your question and we will answer you um, in just a second. So give me just one second to get this video live. These guys could talk about solar tornadoes. I'm giving them my time, so they should be very, very nice to me. There you go, Derek. Justin, do you want to handle this? Unfortunately, I have a person doing some lawn equipment, that, so I don't want to compete with that. Do you want to talk about these solar sure, tornadoes? Sure, yeah, no problem. Look at that, Amy. That is that is fantastic. I'm actually looking for some sharks in there, so uh, it'll probably be the next movie coming out, right? Um, the thing about the sun is that you've got the state of... Do you just seriously make a fire sharknado joke? <laughs> Yeah, you know what? If Hollywood's thinking for ideas for new movies, uh, I could help write the screenplay for... Re repeat uh, movies? Yeah, exactly. The, the sun <laughs> sharknado. Um, but uh, the, the state of matter, this plasma, is very uh, highly manipulated by the... Uh, 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 the uh, I guess uh, mo the magnetic fields of the sun, what you're actually seeing are the, the plasma being affected by these magnetic fields. So just an image like this one here, you've got the sun alive with magnetic fields. The plasma is being lifted, pulled, stretched. Um, and, and what you're actually seeing is truly the magnetic field of the sun, um, but the, how the plasma reacts to it. And so in that situation where you had this uh, solar tornado. That was fantastic. I had, and you said that's pretty recent, right? I had never seen that particular one. Um, you are just seeing these uh, charged particles, these streams, this uh, plasma being lifted, being twisted, uh, being spun around by uh, the sun's magnetic field. And just, uh, it, it never gets old. Looking at the a uh, sun is, uh, in, t in my mind, is a lot like looking at the moon from an astronomy perspective. It never gets old because there's always these subtle changes that are happening. Now, of course, this image that Amy is showing you is not what you're going to get from a, just a typical telescope. These are uh, space telescopes, uh, high end. But even with uh, a backyard telescope using a, a solar filter 
a white light filter, you, you can pull out these sunspots, you can pull out these prominences and, and see the active movement of what's happening on this incredible uh, ball of gas. And the reason why you get these incredible activities is the, the sun is rotating at different speeds uh, at different places. And so that magnetic field just gets twisted and twisted and twisted. And this is the result of that twisting. Uh, these fantastic features that you're seeing here. And, and these solar tornadoes can approach speeds of, of over a million miles an hour, uh, sending particles from the sun shooting off into space. And sometimes if these space twisters reach Earth, they can cause some pretty nasty events. I think you're back on mute, Amy. There. I thought I was off mute. I guess I muted myself rather than unmuting myself. So um, we have a friend here with us from India today, Satish. Uh, please correct me if I'm saying your name wrong. I really like to say it right for you. Um, but so there is an annual eclipse occurring in India, um, over Africa, India, um, parts of Europe, um, parts of Australia. Um, tomorrow, which will still be our today. So if you're in the Northern Hemisphere uh, and you're in uh, you know, the United States, so from where I am at 9 p.m. tonight, I'll be able to watch the annular solar eclipse um, on a live cast. Um, but uh, if you are in North America, you will not be able to see the eclipse just from your house. Um, but eclipses are, um, I'm sorry, I'm actually choking right now, but um, so this is a, a pretty cool event. I'm like, I'm sitting in an 80 degree office. So don't tell you guys what, it's hot in here, hot and dry, not hot and wet like it is in Florida for those guys. So they're like drinking, they're just drinking the air down there. Uh, we're like, I open my mouth and like a shot of dirt goes in. Um, so you're, you're seeing sort of what it's like to live in all different places today. But uh, an eclipse, whether it's an annular eclipse or a total solar eclipse is an event you definitely want to watch. So um, anybody who's out there, just please go ahead and, and make sure you watch that. So we're not really covering eclipses today um, from the whole perspective because other professionals are going to cover them in real time uh, in the next few hours. Um, so for those of you who are in the path of the eclipse, you're going to see that live um, and be able to engage in those types of events live. And then for those of us uh, you know, live in C2, excuse me, and for the rest of us, we can engage with those lives. So we're not going to spend time on that uh, today. But um, so I have another, uh, I want to talk to you guys a little bit now about why some of these videos look the way that they, they look. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I've got a lot going on over here. So let's see if we can find it. I'm going to, ooh, learning things. Okay, so let's see. I had it. All right, there we go. Um, so I'm going to show you guys a video that's a, a little bit older, um, but I want to talk to you about why I, why I am showing this to you. Uh, because we've shown you a lot of videos today. Somebody mentioned in the chat that there was a very orange image of the sun. And I'm going to talk to you about why we're showing you things like that and, and why you are seeing that. Sorry, we're having a little, suddenly I forgot how to share screen. Okay. So, um, so I want to talk to you guys about what you are seeing. So before I actually start the video, um, does anybody out there know uh, and, and even the presenters can, can answer this. What are you looking at right now? You are looking at the sun, but, uh, but what are you looking at? It looks like a wonderful uh, kind of a solar maximum period. And we're probably looking at a different uh, 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 field of light, right? Uh, we look in ultraviolet, we look in uh, infrared, but not necessarily the visual that we would pick out from uh, from your standard telescope. Also, yeah, Justin. Oh. oh, sorry, go ahead, Derek. No, yeah, no, I was going to say, yeah, it looks like ultraviolet light. Um, from, from yeah, so we're looking at a different wavelength of light. 
So at the Solar Dynamics Observatory, um, that telescope has an instrument called the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly. And it can look at the sun in 11 uh, different wavelengths of light, uh, or 10, I guess, 10, 10 different ones uh, plus you know, visible light. OK, so um, uh, this light is measured in angstroms. And this is angstrom number 94. And what it does is it highlights uh, regions of the sun's corona during a solar flare. So that's why we're seeing um, much of that space looking dark and then also seeing those really, really bright spots. Okay, so that's what that is for. So, um, so you can actually see at the bottom of the video, probably there, it says SDO, which is Solar Dynamics Observatory. And you can see um, that it is AIA, which is again, that Atmospheric Imaging Assembly 94. So it's actually telling you right there um, what you are looking at and then what date that, that it was taken. This was taken in 2011. Um, so Amy, actually... does, the, uh, does the 94 represent uh, the 94 angstroms or? Yes, yeah, they... that's what it is. So that's the measurement is 94 you're, angstroms. You're close to x-rays there then almost, aren't you? Yeah, so uh, this instrument can go from, uh, I don't know really how low it can go. 94 is the lowest that, that I'm aware of for that purpose, all the way up to 4,500 angstroms. So let's see, we might speed it along a little bit. See what happens. Okay. So uh, this is uh, a little bit obvious, um, right? So uh, we're still in 94. Okay, so we're still at 94 angstroms, but then this is a black and white uh, version of that same video. So what you're looking at here is just if we were to take all of the color out of it and just look at it in, in this way, we actually can see a little bit more. So sometimes those black and white images, they may not seem as exciting um, of the sun, but if you look at this, it's actually really exciting to me. So, I mean, what do you guys think? Justin, like Derek, Bernie, or Stephen, what do you guys, what do you guys think of switching I'm, from- I'm still, having that I'm green still seeing the original image. I'm still on the green myself. Um, I think, I think you're Are just- you? the color no, green. Still green. <laughs> Oh, it went, it just went back and forth. Okay, well, that's okay. We'll just, um, fine. So, um, so now uh, we're in 131 angstroms. Uh, you should be seeing blue. Is everybody seeing blue? Still on green. Green. Really? You might have to unshare and then reshare on the new image. I think yeah, I had that issue once on there. You, you are correct. I think that's what's got to happen here. Okay. Uh, for some reason, I can't even find my Zoom screen. No good. Where is it? Oh, my screen share paused. Why did it pause? It, okay, we're gonna, it's okay. The technical difficulties. Uh, I live for technical difficulties. <laughs> All right. Now there you should go. be- There we go, look at that. <laughs> So uh, this is a little bit, it, it looks a little blue on the screen, but it's really more of a teal color. Okay, and um, this is a 131 angstroms, uh, which it's measuring at 10 million degrees Kelvin. Okay, so um, if we talk about 94 angstroms, we're measuring at about 6 million degrees Kelvin. Um, I can't do that math in my head for what that is in Fahrenheit, sorry. Um, but so uh, what this looks at is the hottest material in a flare. Okay, so hopefully this will, if I hit go, is it gonna go? <laughs> is it turning? <laughs> Someone tell me my video. Yeah, it looks great. Okay. <laughs> great. <laughs> Since I'm running multiple screens, everything is disappearing from me. Um, but uh, so you can sort of see that difference. And, and the reason that I'm showing this, this video to everyone and all of these different wavelengths of light. Okay, so now you're looking at 171 angstroms, which is about 600,000 degrees Kelvin. Um, and this is the, uh, it's looking at an upper transition. So we're looking at the quiet, uh, a quiet corona. That doesn't seem like it's very quiet, does it? Um, but uh, so really what we're looking at is the sun's atmosphere or its corona when it is quiet. 
So uh, this is a relatively quiet corona, even though there's a lot of activity on the surface. So we can also see here that there's a giant um, magnetic arcs or loops, um, and they're called a coronal loop. So you guys can actually see that if you're looking over on the left side of the screen as it turns, you can see those loops happening. And that all links back to those solar tornadoes. Some Someone's ringing. <laughs> Uh, it must, I don't know who's ringing. It's not me. I don't know who was ringing. Um, in any case, so uh, we're not actually going to roll through the entire uh, video here um, because I want to be able to, to take a chance and just uh, take some of the questions. Uh, Pamela's doing a really great job for us answering all the questions um, in the feed there, um, but I want to make sure that all of the speakers have said everything that they wanted to say today. We actually, I have to apologize, we have a, a, another technical difficulty on our side today. And uh, here at the Whipple Observatory uh, and also at our other location in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we have a telescope um, known as the Micro Observatory. And as part of NASA, um, it's funded by NASA. And one of those telescopes has a solar filter on it. And unfortunately, we're having a really difficult time um, getting the, the footage that we need from that telescope for you guys to look at. So I'm going to show you a very brief uh, clip of that telescope. But unfortunately, um, our, our Frank, so not, not Frank that's on the feed right now, but um, Frank Sinkowitz is not going to be able to, to share that information with you today. But hopefully, uh, I, I'm thinking this little clip will at least show you what our, our little telescope Hello. looks like. Whoa, okay, good. So... He recorded me some audio um, since we're struggling just a little bit. So we will, I'm going to share that audio on that video and well, maybe, I don't know what's happening. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Where did it go? Okay. Let's see. I should be able to, to share this. And my apologies again, and thank you everyone for your patience. You know, we don't always have the control um, that we would like. Um, I am not sure we're going to be able to do that. For some reason, that video just does not want to play. Um, it's telling me that it doesn't exist. So I think maybe you guys can see it, but it, it doesn't um, it doesn't want to to participate today. So what we are going to do is um, I will have a, we'll take Frank's pre-recorded version of this just in case we have a problem and, and we'll get it uploaded to our YouTube and you'll be able to watch that uh, a little bit later today. And so that you'll be able to participate in that as well. So I'm very sorry about that. So how those telescopes work is uh, they're, they're actually very little. They're only about this, this big, I don't know how far back I am, um, but they do some pretty amazing things and they are for public use. So I do encourage uh, everyone out there listening today to use those. Um, so I wanna double check in. We've just got a couple of minutes left. You guys have been with us for an hour today. Um, talking about and celebrating the sun. And I want to ask any of our presenters if you guys have anything else. Uh, now I'm looking off to the side like you guys are in the room with me, but uh, uh, anything else you guys want to say or show um, to our audience today? And, and audience out there, if you guys have any questions, now is a really great time to ask a lot of questions. We do seem to have uh, one question from Robin uh, Hengendorn. So Stephen, if you'd like to read off that question from Robin, uh, we can get an answer out to everybody on the feed. Oh, if you're still there, he may not be out there. Uh, so uh, as a reminder to everybody, we, you know, the Arizonans are in the middle of the desert. So uh, we've got some weird technical difficulties going on. But uh, so, um, Robin, I guess your question is, will you be doing more of these live casts? And how do you link to them? Also, do you do talks on planets in the solar system? So we absolutely do. There will be more live casts. So uh, I'll let Derek and Frank uh, talk. Or Justin, we don't have a Frank today. We have a Justin and I keep calling you Frank. I'm sorry, Justin. Okay, so um, <laughs> uh, uh, Emil Beeler Planetarium uh, has a Frank as well. So confusion on my end, my apologies. But so we will be doing more live casts. I'll let uh, Derek and Justin uh, talk about some of the live casts they've been doing. 
Uh, they just had a really cool one last night. Um, and so I hope they'll, they'll repeat that um, again at a later time. But we will put this information up on our Facebook. You can follow us at FL Whipple Observatory on Facebook, or you can follow us on Instagram at Whipple Observatory. We always put that information up there. And while you're on our Facebook, you can join our newsletter and our newsletter will always tell you uh, when these events are. You can also subscribe on YouTube. And when you become a subscriber on YouTube, it will alert you uh, when there is a new, a new live cast going on. But uh, Derek and Justin, eh, sorry, <laughs> it'll be a fruit basket or something. Um, <laughs> if you guys wanna go ahead and talk about the, uh, the live casts that you have coming up, I think now is a great time to do that. Yeah, so we uh, we offer a virtual star parties as well. We do them on uh, Friday nights. Actually, right now we're starting them at 10 p.m. Eastern time because it doesn't get dark uh, now. Thanks, thanks, summer social. Um, you know, longest day of the year. Um, so we are doing those now at 10 p.m. Uh, through July and uh, August. Um, but uh, we just had a we just had a, a program yesterday where we actually teamed up with a friend of mine in Australia and looked at the southern hemisphere sky. And we're looking at doing more of those later on. Um, since they're in winter in the Southern Hemisphere, his, he gets he gets darker earlier, but that means I have to get up at 4 a.m. Uh, to meet with him to do that. So uh, it's all good, but he, he has some really cool things. Um, and uh, Justin, you want to talk about some of our virtual public shows that we do as well? Absolutely. We've, uh, we've really enjoyed, uh, ironically, this uh, um quarantine time we tried to make the most of it to continue the the learning and we've been able to use forums like this uh, to continue to teach the community about space about science about um, uh, current uh, nasa missions so um, on thursday nights at 7 p.m we do a different planetarium show uh, this coming thursday we have a one of the professors at Seminole State College, we'll be partnering with us on a show called Terra, where we'll be talking all about the Earth. Um, but we had a show uh, last week about uh, the observatory and the skies and wayfinding in the history of, of Hawaii, um, tours of the uh, solar system, and uh, things of that nature. So uh, tune in uh, at the Emil Bueller Planetarium on uh, tune in like we have radios, right? Uh, I guess, uh, you know, join us online uh, on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Uh, for those shows, uh, different different format, different show each week, different guest. And then, uh, like Derek said, uh, Friday nights at 10 p.m. We'll do our best with these. Uh, we're moving into summer and uh, clouds and, and rain, but uh, we'll do our best to bring you live telescope views of the night sky at 10 p.m. on on Friday nights, so we have and a I lot wanna, of fun with that. And, I want to uh, add one last thing. Just, um, yeah, um, that uh, we have a YouTube account as well. So uh, if you if you want to see some of our previous recordings, we actually record these sessions every time, just like uh, these here. Uh, so you can visit YouTube.com/slash Seminal Planet. Seminal Planet is our username, and you can just Google Emil Bueller Planetarium. Um, on the uh, on YouTube and be sure to subscribe to us so you can get an update on all the videos that we uh, post. We're actually going to be uploading our our, uh, our oceanic uh, people uh, and wayfinding program we just did uh, this past Thursday and hopefully uh, by the end of today. Um, so we got lots of different programs that you can watch uh, while you're uh, while you're at home and uh, that's that's all I have. Yeah, just one last thing. This has such been a fantastic show and and. You know, we've got this eclipse happening uh, here over in Europe uh, later tonight or tomorrow, uh, but you don't have to wait for an eclipse in order to really appreciate the sun. Um, you know, go go out and grab your grab yourself a pair of eclipse glasses. Make sure they're ISO certified. Make sure that they're safe. Um, but uh, you know, just go out and, and enjoy it. Uh, you know, if you have a telescope. Grab uh, the polymer that uh, allows you to uh, cover it properly and, and enjoy the sun. Be careful, but it's, it's always there and it's always fantastic to view. Uh, you definitely don't have to wait for an eclipse to admire it. And uh, if, you know, some dates you can write down real quick, if you got a pen and paper handy, October 2023, there will be an annual eclipse here in North America. Uh, in April of 2023, 24, there will be a total solar eclipse. 
And we're really excited for August of 2045. We've already got our calendar circled for that. We will have a total solar eclipse coming right above us in Orlando with over six minutes of totality. So I'm taking my multivitamin every day to make sure I'm around for that. We should be so lucky as to be alive in 2045. <laughs> At this rate, I'm not going right. to count my chances on that one, Justin. Um, <laughs> by the way, the the Tucson Club um, also has virtual star parties uh, online. We just finished up the series uh, in conjunction with the National Park Service on the Grand Canyon National Park website, and I believe those are still available. If you go to the uh, the Grand Canyon website. Uh, you'll see it under Grand Canyon National uh, um, Virtual Star Party uh, as uh, replayable on YouTube. And, and also we have our next club um, star party scheduled for a uh, virtual party uh, scheduled for August 15th. I know that's quite a ways out in the future, uh, but um, that's the next one that we have scheduled out of Tucson. So maybe you can catch that one too. Oh, well, that's great. I, I mean, I'll be there. I'll be watching the virtual. Um, look, now this thing is starting to try to play again. <laughs> Frank's video really, really wants to play, you guys. <laughs> um, but again, we'll, we'll just get it uploaded. It wants to play, but it doesn't want to play live. So um, thank you so much to everyone again for coming. Thank you, Pamela, so much for being the catalyst for International Sunday and for getting people jazzed up about the summer solstice. We, we couldn't do the things that we do without you, um, without the immense amount of support uh, that you give to the astronomical community to get us all jazzed up and doing these types of events. Uh, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys all next time, hopefully uh, next Friday night with the Emil Beeler Planetarium. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. Bye. Bye.